our representative David Lucas in the house. I can remember being a younger, much younger girl, and I knew him from home, but I really learned him away from home. He get a little just silence. Um, I was bell bonding, which I still will do if it's a good bond, but I was working for my uncle's bonding company, Foster Bell Bonds, and Mr. Rogers Hornsby had me writing a resolution, um, and it was like the bell bond fee was being raised from 10% to 15, to 12 and 15%, and um, it had been 20 years, and so he, he wrote the resolution up, and he was teaching me a whole lot of things. Um, you remember Mr. Rogers Hornsby? He's dead now. But he was um, in the bonding, and he said, baby, let me tell you what you do. You, you, it ain't nothing wrong with taking care of your representative. These young folks nowadays, they don't know. You can dress your representative. You can, you can make sure they doing everything they need to do to help, to help get some civic things done. So anyway, I had to walk around. This is my first time ever having to walk around. And is that lobbying when you're talking to all the different representatives and telling them why this should happen? So yes. I was lobbying, telling the little people why we should get a, uh, a bond fee raise because it had been 20 years. We had our little script together and everything. And um, I would see David Lucas, whatever, and he'd be walking around and then you could smoke in public. He had his big cigar, would be on the floor. It wasn't lit though, was it? You wasn't smoking in there, were you? Inside the general assembly, but he be walk around with his cigar in his mouth, and then everybody, you know, they punch these little red and green. How many people know the legislative procedures? Not many. Not many. Oh, we got to get better. So anyway, yeah, I, I know a lot of people don't, because a lot of times when I'm talking trash and talking about how I feel about some people, be like, ain't nothing we can do about that, Yo, We can't change nothing. I'll be like. You a damn fool. We can't change the law. You don't know nothing. So anyway, we're going to get it together. Thank you, Mr. Lucas, for that insight. We got representatives in the house. We got grandmas in the house. We got young folks in the house. That's what Poet of Peace is all about. Now, up next is a scholar. And his name is Mike Scott. Mike Scott. The poet. Mike Scott. You better watch out for him. He's going to tell you his website. Um, he's dynamic. I love him. Let's give it up for Mike Scott. Woo! What's going on, Poetic Peace? How y'all doing? Mike Scott. Mike Scott. Mike Scott. What's up, man? Mad yeah. love. Mad love to everybody that's supporting the movement. Uh, yeah, we about to take this thing worldwide, man. We're doing our thing. Y'all going to see cameras following me and the crew. Uh, so don't get, don't be alarmed. Okay. We're getting some, some promotional footage put together, some more footage for the website. Uh, y'all make sure y'all check out the website, uh, www.mikescottthepoet.com. We're actually um, almost done booking our fall events and performances. It's, I'm telling you, it's, God is moving. I'm going to say it's God is moving. All right. it's, it's a real blessing. Yeah. So we're just going to keep doing this thing. So um, you good? All right, I'm going to do this piece. It's entitled, I Decided. I decided, I decided to write. I saw some things I didn't like, so I decided to write. I saw some things about life that I did not like, so I decided to write. I saw some things that I didn't like about life, so I decided to write about the wrongs to make them right in life. I saw some things that I did not like, so I decided to write. When I saw myself, between the lines of words written inside the notebook of a young writer. Said to me he wanted to be a poet. Wasn't exactly sure what it meant to write poetry, but he told me that it took him away. He felt like because he was writing, waking up in the morning didn't seem to hurt as much. And these words across scattered pages became his release. An attempt to free him from the overwhelming heartbreak he faced every single day as he studied the reflection of his own image in the mirror because that was the only occasion he saw any remnants of his father, who left him, was never there, and never even bothered to stick around long enough to see what kind of man he would become. And so he hurt every birthday, every Christmas, and every Father's Day that he was without his father. He hurt every single time he wrote his first next to his last name. He hurt and I hurt when he looked at me and he asked me, he said, what do you do if you can't find happiness? What does it feel like to love? What if my heart won't allow me to be happy or to love? And in that moment, I decided. 
when at first I couldn't see the needs. Felt like writing was all I had to keep me sane in life. But pain in life would always bleed through. So you tell me what am I writing for? If these words aren't enough to answer him, you see, I did the math. One child plus nothing to encourage his aspirations equals a hopeless dream. And one household minus one father figure could only equal a broken home. And where I'm from, hopeless dreams plus broken homes don't equal high school diplomas or college degrees. So how can I look him in the face and tell him, soon your pain will end and you'll find what you've been searching for. And every night that you've waited to understand your sorrow would not have left you in vain. When I know that the odds are already against him, how can I tell him that love will come and fulfillment will come when I myself, I'm still waiting for the same, counting the months, the years and days that I spent without my father. It still feels like a part of me is missing. And I hadn't known him long enough to say that I had missed him, but I missed him every birthday, every Christmas. I missed him every holiday and for graduations. I missed him every night, folded tight under my covers, afraid to sleep because of noises outside of my room window, praying for my father to come and protect me, wondering if he wanted to be there but just couldn't, or was I just that much of an inconvenience so he wouldn't choose me over something he felt was more important. You see, I hurt, and I could see in this young man's eyes how he hurt because I saw pieces of myself in him, and in every word written by the ink from his pen, it was almost as if I was staring into a mirror. And as painful as it was, I looked at myself. I looked at myself and I said to myself, I said, you decide. You decide. Make the decision to find contentment instead of grief. Decide that in you are already the tools necessary for you to succeed. Refuse to fit inside of society's equation. Create your own mathematical structures and become your own variable so that nothing from nothing equals all of your needs and everything equals that same nothing plus all of your dreams. Write a new life beyond what your eyes can see. Don't be afraid to allow your emotions to pour heavy onto blank pages of inspiration, inspiring anybody or bodies who can hasten their ears long enough to listen. You decide to love wholeheartedly, even when you're afraid to believe in love and all of its flaws, all of its wrongs, and all of its rights, rights for all of its rights, rights for all of its rights. You decide, you decide, you must decide to write because one day your decision might just change someone else's life. You decide, you decide, you must decide to write because one day, one day your decision it might change someone else's life. If you 